Tilly skipped her biology lecture? Way to go, bridge crew. Solve that problem. Please state the nature of the galactic emergency. Whoa. More surprises to come on today's <laughs> Biotrekkie with the Admiral, starting now. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Biotrekkie with the Admiral. I'm, I'm Mohammed Noor. I'm a biology professor at Duke University and occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. And I'm Jane Brooke. I played Admiral Katrina Cornwell in the first two seasons of Star Trek Discovery. And I'm always happy to be here talking all things biology uh, with Mohammed. But we have a, as you can see, very special guest with us today to add to the fun. So... I am Robert Picardo. I played the emergency medical hologram on the Federation Starship Voyager for seven seasons. And you may not know that I was a biology major at Yale for, yeah, I guess, about um, most all of my sophomore year, whenever you had to declare being a biology major. And then into the beginning of my junior year, and then my, uh, my avocation of acting sort of took over. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I was in a big production on campus that got me out of pre-med and into theater. But I, uh, biology, I consider my first love. Um, my ambition was to go into medicine. So it's always a pleasure um, to, uh, to talk biology. <laughs> or I'm thrilled great. too that you've connected like your, your passion for science with your acting, both in the roles you've had, as well as in your, your roles with the Planetary Society too, so. Well, Kudos that's what I, I say to people. How long have you loved? Uh, when they say, how did you fall in love with space? I said, well, I fell in love with biology first. But now that we're getting this close to finding evidence of microbial life off world, off of Earth, it, it's like it's all coming together. That my childhood passion for biology and now Star Trek and space has brought me back to biology out there. Yes. And I love that you said microbial because people always ask me, what, what kind of life do you think we're most likely to find? And microbial is the way to go. So 100% yeah. agree. <laughs> well, how great. So Mohammed, you have two people who loved biology in college mm -hmm. and uh, went into theater once they did a play. So the power of theater. <laughs> I so, took theater uh, and I was terrible at it. So I had to stay with biology. <laughs> you stayed. But uh, so today we are talking about the last two episodes of season four of Discovery. And we'll just start the normal way. Mohammed, can you give us a couple of bullet points of the biological the biology um, points that you want to make about these two episodes. Absolutely. So I had two things I wanted to bring up specifically. We talked last time already about the chemical communication with the 10C, so I'm not going to go through all of that again, but there were two things I thought were, would be fun to talk about. And then a, a longer piece that isn't so much biology, but I want to bring you all in to talk about the ethics. So the, the two pieces I'd like to talk about, one, I want to go a little bit in depth on this idea of um, basically the benefit of working together in diverse groups, because it's interesting, this was discussed in, this, in the context of solving this problem with respect to the 10C. And it's a sociological thing, but there's biological connections. The quick comment I want to talk about is this confusion about the 10C, whether humans are one versus many. And what essentially defines the boundaries of the end of an organism? I thought that would be interesting to talk about for a couple of minutes. Very Do you want to talk about that one now or go back to the first one? And uh, Let me go back to the first one. So. Okay. Um, they said specifically solving this hydrocarbon mystery required a diversity of perspectives or a variety of perspectives, right? And we saw in this episode that Lieutenant Christopher had a proposal. Um, Nilsen, uh, Nilsen's piano experience played a role in this. Uh, Detmer made some comment about a comparison to star maps. And all that together helped them solve this fairly complex puzzle that, you know, Burnham, Harai, them alone working out was not, was not going to actually get to the solution. And there's a lot of sociological studies, and this is way outside of biology, I'll come back to biology in just a moment. There's a lot of sociological studies showing that diverse work groups are more productive, more creative, and more innovative than non-diverse ones. So I'll give you one example. There was a study published about 25 years ago that compared uh, basically uh, groupings of a single race versus groupings with three or four ethnic backgrounds. And they were told to generate solutions for a problem. I think the problem was something like how to get more tourists. And then this, these blind uh, judges had to judge these things in the context of you know, um, essentially like what was the most creative, what was the, what was the best quality of idea, things like that. And go figure, the ones with the most diversity did the best, the ones with like say three ethnic groups did a little bit worse, but still better than one ethnic group. 
It was very compelling. And there's a lot of studies like that now showing similar things, not just based on race, but also based on gender, based on age, things like that. And in the context of say, critical analysis of decisions or identifying good alternatives, things like that. So because that's really we fill cool. in, we fill in Wait. each other's blind spots. That's why. And that's I mean, a great, you, 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 yeah. That's a great core value of Star Trek in general, that we are stronger in our diversity. And that's why we have so many, you know, different faces and alien species on the bridge and all that. So it's, it's, uh, it's not only true, uh, as you said, for um, problem solving and for, and, and in that way, it's, it's evolutionarily adaptive, but it's also, it's, it's a core value of, of uh, Roddenberry's future. I love, actually, I love what you said, Bob, because it's a perfect transition to the biology aspect to it. That's <laughs> absolutely right. So in general, there's a lot of studies looking at, say, conservation of species and species that have the most genetic diversity, sort of similar to this idea of idea diversity. Those are the ones that are most likely to adapt and survive or persist over long periods of time. That if you have inbred populations, and I should clarify, when I say inbred, I don't necessarily mean like they're mating with their siblings, but just lacking in genetic diversity. <laughs> you don't mean the royal, the royal families of Europe? Yeah, they're, they're inbred from the direct, uh, direct things, but it's just essentially species lacking genetic diversity. Those are the ones that, that tend to have a lot of these bad recessive mutations that are, that are being made homozygous, since you're bringing together two of the same ones that are then being exhibited, or they're lacking the variation needed to adapt to new environments. So I love that because it's a cool analogy between biology as well as sort of the sociology of these things that, you know, we, we can, similar to these bad mutations, we can more easily wrongly reinforce bad ideas, you know, if we have a very homogenous group, or we can fail to come up with outside the box new ideas if we lack diversity. Again, very analogous to the, the actual biological aspect to it. So I thought that was really cool. <laughs> well, it makes common sense. It's, you know, it's common sense, it seems to me. Um, yeah. And it's nice because it agrees with our values, right? In the sense that we, we, we want to do this because we know it's the right thing to do, but it actually just solidly makes a positive difference too in the context of solving these problems. So it, that's an aspect that I find really appealing to it. Yeah, and that's where the science, um, the scientific support of it helps us because we don't always want to hear the ideas of nope. someone else. Nope, so. we don't, and w even when we really should. Yeah. <laughs> So I, let us I, know. Oh, so no, Bob. I, go I have a question about your last discussion because I missed the sure. discussion of this way that the um, that the species tensi communicates using these large uh, molecules, hydrocarbons. Uh, yep, hydrocarbons. And did you talk about um, the analogy of of uh, pheromones? And, oh yeah. Uh, I would uh, and 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 the what the stereochemical theory of smell or something. I remember the, um, these are things that I'm pulling back from 45 years ago. Good for you. I'm that is impressive. Giant, I, I don't know those, the stereochemical theory. Theory that, well, that when you're smelling something, you're actually smelling, you're, you're actually uh, molecules of that. This is, these are for people who, who, are, who, who hate flushing the toilet with the lid open. This oh, yeah. is for you guys, <laughs> right? We call the microfecal particles that you're mm -hmm. afraid when it flushes are going to go up in the air. Well, if you heard the stereochemical theory of, uh, of how we smell, you, you really realize that little tiny little bits of things in the air oh, are yeah. going in and, 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 uh, and they're the receptors, the smell receptors inside your uh, nasal passage are actually, they're, those, they're fitting in. Yes. This, as I said, this is 45 year old. Oh uh, yeah, no, I think you're exactly classwork. right. I didn't know that title, okay. but you're exactly right. That's exactly what's okay. happening. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny with these hydrocarbons. The one thing we talked about a little bit last time, I'll just recap just a, a brief thing. And uh, the, the challenge there is that the, whether these hydrocarbons would elicit the same effect in humans as it does in this extremely alien species, right? And realistically it probably wouldn't, but what was nice is that this was addressed directly. I, and I remember this being a conversation when we were actually working on writing this aspect of the episode. So that's why there's this comment made by Saru saying, oh, look, it affects me the similar to these others. And Saru being an alien is actually very different from us. So it doesn't, it doesn't really fix the problem, but it at least acknowledges that there is something there. The one thing we did do is we insist that these hydrocarbons are large and complex. So they're not something that we here on earth would have encountered regularly. Because the, the ex extreme example I used is if, if it was methane. So let's say it was just a carbon with four hydrogens, which is obviously a hydrocarbon. And let's say that's associated with sadness. That means every time like we pass gas, like the people around us are feeling <laughs> sad. Well, people does do. happen with me. <laughs> but I do think the complexity, I mean, I don't know if that complexity gives you 
the license to say that it would affect a Kelpian as well as an Ameri- uh, uh, I said American, because they're yeah. American actors, but you know, a human, yeah. um, because it's such a unknown complex hydrocarbon. Yeah, Who knows? exactly. It's just, it adds uncertainty. They're like, okay, well, we don't know. <laughs> we haven't encountered it. Right. But there were, limit, there, were, there were a limit of only something, it, it was around two dozen, 22, 23 different yeah. um, hydrocarbons. It's basically so enough that, to make a language. Exactly. So different, different um, concepts were blends of that because they say it was exactly. 22% this and 11% I loved that. that. I yeah. loved that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they were put and, together in a supra molecule, which is essentially this, this solid structure that would have the different hydrocarbons in different positions around it. And that was what the lights then were identifying which hydrocarbon in which order to be read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I actually the, wrote that down 25% joy, 22% sadness, 17% peacefulness. I love that, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Yeah. Um, and well, soon you can get that on Amazon. You can just have it. You know, <laughs> I'm saying, um, I, I, I wondered uh, also the fact that this creature, I mean, you may have talked about this already, was of one accord. It was not, it wasn't like the Borg hive mind where, where you were enforced into one point of view. There was this harmonious mm-hmm, mm-hmm. kind of, the, their whole society seemed to agree on everything, which is why, interestingly, they can make the decision at the end so quickly once they've yes. heard that their DMA, it, which they're using to, to, you know, to um, harvest power, to hunt for and find power, that it's harming other civilizations. They can make that decision instantly because they don't have to go to Congress and they don't have to go to the Senate. <laughs> and that when a terrible thing happens, when you find out that there's terrible destruction happening in the world as we are now, you can make an instantaneous decision to mm-hmm. stop doing a bad thing or to to help by doing a good thing. And Absolutely. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, hundred percent agree. That actually leads into the, the, the second biology topic. Exactly. Boy, Bob, oh, you're good. on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is an interesting question. What defines the end of an organism? Like where, I mean, for us, it's, it's mostly straight court. It's mostly straightforward. Like I end at the end of this physical body right here, but there are a lot of species out there that are essentially like clonal colonies. So you might be familiar with there's some fungi, for example, that have these mycelia that will extend for miles. I mean, in theory, they're all, I mean, they're just these cells that have divided and divided by, and they're all still connected. There's some connection all the way across there. Does it still count as one organism? Uh, there's aspen trees that are essentially tree. I was going to say the trees. Yeah. Yeah. They're, aspen, yeah, they're, they're colonies of clones that they can grow for miles too. So it's interesting to think like, you know, how much connection in between, say, cells or units is necessary for it to still to be one organism? And does it have to be genetically the same? Or could you have things that are maybe slightly genetically different over time? And even within our bodies, for example, like if, if you compare the cells at the tip of this finger with the cells at this t- the tip of this finger, there's probably a couple of mutations that distinguish them. So they're not 100% the same, because as the cells were dividing, probably a couple of changes have happened. So how different is it? And is, is it, what's more important, the connection versus not... I, mean, I don't have answers well, for these things. I'm just well, I'm it's funny because I always jump in when Mohammed talks about these biology concepts. I'm always jumping in with the, you know, I don't know, metaphysical or the mm-hmm. philosophical or the theological or whatever, you know, the word is. But I would argue that's a problem when we think of humans as, you know, in, in the West and in the States, we think so much of the individual. But you could argue in a, um, maybe not in this tangible physical way, but we are so connected. I mean, it's the basic ontological truth of human life relationship. So we're not connected like aspen trees or fungi, but we are Mm -hmm. cut off one part of the human family and it affects all of us, you know? Absolutely true. What was the analogy? Were they, this alien species, um, the 10 C, were Mm -hmm. they almost, were they like this very sort of sentient coral or what were, it's a good what, question. What kind yeah, of they a, didn't understand. They didn't understand um, that there was individual. They didn't have a concept for individual existence. But then yeah. they got it. They got it. But they were. The not, but it is. A, it is a species. It is not a single individual that we yeah. that we were making first contact with, and we're communicating simultaneously with the entire species. Correct. Yeah. Wasn't I mean, that what we're at happening? least defining it as a species. I don't know if they would define themselves as a species <laughs> versus mm-hmm. an individual. Maybe from their perspective, they were just they're one. They are one, and they are communicating with us. Well, but question. they seem to be physically individual, like sure, us, because they just they discovered the bones in that mm-hmm. uh, episode that Bob wouldn't have seen, which oh, was yeah, eleven, 11 right? Mm-hmm. So they discovered some huge bones. 
So it might be sort of what I was talking about where maybe there's like there fingernails were, for us though. <laughs> we yeah, let them go. Right. There <laughs> individual, what we would call individual beings, but a kind of higher consciousness yeah. that makes them one. Yeah. Um, possibly. No, it's really interesting. But that actually leads me to the question I wanted to ask you guys. So I would love to hear your thoughts on, so the 10C, there was this conversation between 10C and book at the very end with regard to uh, them being apologetic about not harming things. And they said, we, we're sorry, we didn't realize there was sentient life there. So what life is worth preserving? Because <laughs> book, book took the attitude of they, they shouldn't be doing this at all. But it, from their perspective, they were doing this. And it's not that they didn't know there was life. They just didn't know it was life that was self-aware. Well, Bob did some great episodes on Voyager dealing with this issue. So Bob, I'll hand it to you first. Uh, we, we had um, some very interesting medical ethics episodes on Voyager. Um, one of my favorite that I recommended for Jane to watch, mm -hmm. and Jane does her homework, by the way. That's oh, another yeah. reason she, oh, yeah. she should have stayed a biology major. <laughs> I, know, uh, I should have. <laughs> um, I'm a very good student. <laughs> the episode was called Nothing Human. And in it, um, uh, Bellana Torres has the, it, this giant uh, alien creature that looks like a, a trilobite, a mm -hmm. big rubber trilobite, is fused to her body. And the only way to, um, to remove it is to use a medical discovery that was, um, that was uh, made using torture. This character, Krell Mosette, and I, uh, my character, the doctor, um, basically accesses his work on the, on the, medic, um, the medical database. So I'm mm -hmm. talking to him as a, histor as a hologram, mm -hmm. who is the historical representation of this guy who was basically like Dr. Mengele, Mengele was. Yeah. Um, for the, uh, he, he was, he was um, in order to, to cure a terrible virus, which of course, you know, the, I thought of this episode quite a bit lately with everything we've been going through, but this terrible viral pandemic called the Fastosa virus, in order to cure it, he experiments on humans, killing a large number of subjects, but saving millions more because of the medical discovery. So the question was basically, is a, a discovery tainted by the manner in which, um, a medical discovery tainted by the manner in which you accomplish that discovery or does the discovery itself have no moral component once you have made the discovery however and and that and torturing and killing people has ended and you now have this discovery should you use that or or is that um is that somehow um immoral and that was what the whole discussion balana torres character would not did not want um to be saved by using this terrible man's um, discovery because of, of uh, what a horrific um, person he'd been. Yeah. And then another episode that, uh, that um, Jane watched was called Critical Care, which was basically mm -hmm. Voyager's um, dealing with um, uh, managed healthcare. And in that particular episode, the doc, my, my character is hijacked by this sort of giant spaceship that's like, um, that, that's, like a hospital yeah. with various levels of care. There's like seven levels and the top tier is sort of country club care. And then the bottom tier is just barely get enough drugs to keep you alive. And different members of the society are accorded healthcare according to their perceived societal value, yeah. right? If you are, if you're a very wealthy person and you made some terrific invention, then you get the best possible care. Um, and the doctor, of course, uh, that violates his, uh, his programmed ethics, and he tries to, uh, to take over, to steal uh, medicines from the top level and bring them down. It was, quite an, uh, it was also a very thought-provoking episode. And those were some yeah, of my so. favorites, really, the, the, um, the, the uh, ethical issues. Because that's what science fiction, to me, does the best. By setting it in this imaginary future, you can you know, you can isolate all of mm -hmm. whatever our contemporary trappings are that are blinding us to, to, our, uh, to figuring out a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you get a clearer look at it somehow. So uh, yes, I, was, uh, I, do love, I do love when Star Trek handles um, ethics like that. And because my character was medical, I particularly liked it in that arena. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, in addition to not wanting to use or thinking it's, morally neutral to use discoveries that were made uh, with atrocious means. But also it's that um, 
the Krell character didn't mind just cutting into the alien right. and causing great pain to a clearly mm -hmm. sentient being. Yeah, uh, Nazi analogies. He was just very interested in that, you know, and he's like, do you want to save your crewmate or not? It, it, it was really well done because you, you said, you said to yourself, I know Roxanne. So I'm like, save Roxanne, <laughs> save her. But the, but, but you're right, Bob, about when they, you, when you put it in the future, you can see the, you can see it quite clearly, the, um, the argument without getting defensive, you know? Um, so I don't know that we can I, I answer it this, here. The section where he, um, when I call him out for what you've just described, and he said, almost all of the, uh, of your species medical discoveries were found from experiments on lower animals. Dogs. Yes, exactly. And, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and it's mm -hmm. outrageous to us to think that people used to say, you know, when they would do vivisection, well, they don't feel it. They don't feel <laughs> the pain. They used to say that about babies as well. So it's, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, in any case, the, 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 long uh, argument that he, the Mosette character and the doctor have mm -hmm. really, um, you can really see how he uses our human rationales uh, against, against us. Mm -hmm. You know, he, mm -hmm. he, he points out all of, the, all of the holes in my logic in, in attacking him. Um, so yeah, I thought it was, a, and he's, a, a David uh, Clennon is such a wonderful actor and a personal friend. So it was I remember shooting that very well because it was just such a joy to work with him again because we had been we we'd been in a a show together a a play years before and been really close friends ever since. So anyway, and he played was... it so charming. I mean, he was like a charming character. But I, I guess as you were talking, suddenly an answer came to my mind oh, about not an answer, the answer, but a possible answer to this very difficult ethical dilemma, mm -hmm. and that is if you can take something horrible and use it for good mm -hmm. do you um redeem it do you make the deaths of the people who were tortured um worth something do you value those lives in a way that they were not valued at the time because then you wonder if the people who were tortured would say don't make this for nothing you know, it's mm -hmm. almost like a sa saving True. private Ryan moment. You know, if yeah. you're going to live, make something of it, you know, mm -hmm. so maybe it's risky maybe though, because you're, you're almost maybe. endorsing it to happen again, though. That's the risk, of course. I mean, I agree with oh, you. Oh, because you're because it. you're not using the answer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know, but I'm, I just suddenly popped into my mind when when you use good point, something, but, the, you know, you can't uh, you can't you got to be careful about that. Um mm -hmm. Mm. Right. You it's can't, not, you can't use we, that before the fact, you know, I'm going to mm -hmm. do this horrible thing. Yeah. Um, but perhaps after there's nothing more we can do about that horrible thing, can we redeem it? You know, can there be a sort of not resurrection? What's the word? Redemption, you know? Redemption. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good question. But, oh, sorry, please. Well, that was certainly, I, I think that was certainly, um, the argument I think that my character ended up with was that, you know, was that, uh, that they will not have died in vain, but you're absolutely right. You cannot, it's not for us to judge. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're not the ones who were tortured, uh, to, right. to, to, uh, you know, so it's not, it, it sounds like a rationale on our part right. to just take right. the goodies, you know, the medical right. goodie and use it. Uh, so it's a very, it is a very complicated issue and you don't ever want to find yourself in a situation where you are rationalizing that kind of, that's right, that you're rationalizing that kind of horrific behavior. Well said, well said. So if we were to go to some other world and let's say there was some very basic life there, is it okay to destroy it? Let's say, for example, in order for our rockets to land there, it's going to kill off some of it. Is that Okay. And what, how basic does it have to be? Is it, if it's, you know, microbial, is that okay? Is it, you know, did it have to be well, running around? Well, they've even shown that plants can feel, yeah. you know, they do, plants feel things. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's tough. I mean, it was, I mean, we can say, for example, with, with food that, that, you know, mm -hmm. we shouldn't eat anything alive, but obviously like we have to eat something alive, otherwise we'll go extinct too. But <laughs> mm -hmm. at, at least, at least then it's, it's necessary for our survival as opposed to something else. Well, we, we tend not to give a lot of thought to um, single celled organisms, exactly. very primitive organisms. I mean, if the rocket is going to kill, you know, uh, 
assuming there is these there are some microorganisms that are living in the the crust of the planet that that we were landing on mm -hmm. i i don't think that people have taken the the planetary protection mantra to that level yeah. you know you certainly don't want to we don't want to change what we're observing obviously that's yeah. whatever i can't never remember the name of that scientific pr principle but we don't want the act of observing it to change what we're trying to observe and measure. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly we don't want to destroy something or change something so that our, it not only taints our discovery, but, but it's also not fair to the creatures on the planet and certainly not fair to other human explorers who land uh, if, if they don't, if we don't equally value, all of the space capable nations don't equally value the importance of, of planetary protection, which by the way, if you're confusing planetary defense and planetary protection, don't be embarrassed. I did for a long time. Planetary uh, defense, of course, is, oh, don't want to get hit by an asteroid. Let's yeah. make some plans for that. Planetary protection is when, you, in, when we land a rover on Mars, for example, how do we protect the planet that we're exploring? And not contaminate it, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, I remember there's a there's a planetary protection officer here on Earth. I was like, wow, that's like the best title in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Earth's planetary protection officer. Well, what was what was um uh, the surprise guest star of Stacey Abrams, which just knocked me out at the end of the show? Is she, was she the president of the Federation or Not the pre president of Earth? What was Earth. she? Of Earth, Earth. because you Earth know, had I, left I, the Federation. I was once the president of Earth too in Voyager episodes um, that were. Uh, there were had a holodeck program called captain planet oh i was the president of earth so yes so she i was very happy to see that uh that we had made such a great choice with uh <laughs> stacy abrams in, followed in good mm -hmm. footsteps there <laughs> mm -hmm. very cool i do remember they gave me a hamburg hat so i looked quite a bit like you know a, a woodrow wilson <laughs> like a 40s yeah i was gonna say something yeah. yeah speaking of uh of your character we were talking uh earlier too about how in theory your character could show up right now at the end of of this season of discovery because there's that version of you from the episode living witness that mm -hmm. you know had, had essentially been left alone for 700 years and then lived on that planet for several hundred more years and then had gone back to the alpha quadrant so in theory, you could show up right now. <laughs> I, I think yeah, I, you could show up anywhere with being a you know a hologram. You could yeah, show up anywhere. That's true too. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it is definitely one of the advantages. And once you're there, you don't have to eat. You don't have to go to the restroom. You don't have to shower. It's really there's a lot of it solves a lot of problems being a hologram. That's awesome. Well, I have a question for you guys too about the production side, if you don't mind. So this was the season finale. I'm curious from an actor's perspective, so both from, say, like a, you know, a, season, a series regular or from a recurring role, what is different about being in a season finale for you all as opposed to just, you know, a random episode in the middle of the season? If anything, maybe the answer is not much. I mean, there's just personal human things like, you know, you're not going to see your friends for a while if it's okay. the if it's the season and the show finale, then there's a lot of emotion around that. Yeah. So all of the filming is um, even more uh, weighted with emotion. Um, but I would say there's not a difference in terms of acting. There's a difference in terms of atmosphere because okay. you're not going to be carrying on. Uh, you might not see each other for three months or ever again on this show. <laughs> I would say also yes. If it's if it's the series finale, then there's all then that can be quite emotional because you've yeah. spent so many years, years. Yeah. working together. Um, and uh, then there's also the situation where you don't you don't know whether if 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 you're doing the finale get... <laughs> and you don't know if you're picked up. Like I recently right. only recently heard that Picard is concluding its three year run. That that's going to be the end of it. And but of course, um, Discovery knows that they're coming back. They know that they're doing another season. So I would say that uh, usually if you've been shooting really hard and you're really exhausted, you're, you're really dreaming about that first week off when you can just catch up on your rest and, and, and start to catch up with your family and your friends and all the things that, you know, that if you've been there long hours um, that you want to do. But, uh, but I, otherwise, I don't necessarily think it's easy, except perhaps in the back of your mind, there's always, you know, ultimately you do get to that season finale, which is the series finale. So I think it is, especially after you've been running a few years, 
I'm certain when we did our season finale in season six, it was in the back of my mind that, oh, got one more year doing this oh, wow. and then it's over. So I think that, yeah, it's really about, and, and it, as I'm sure Jane feels the same way, it isn't just the family of actors that are on screen, it's the entire mm. crew. I mean, you develop oh, yeah. friendships with, with a lot of people who work on the show from the production office to um, all of the people on the crew and craft service and everything. So it's, it's really a, a big family at that point. And it's sad when you start thinking about the ultimate goodbye. Yeah. Hmm. A lot of analogies to, I guess, academia, the end of the school year kind of thing where everybody's going to go off for the summer and then maybe come back or at the end you graduate and move on and you don't come back, I guess. <laughs> I remember when I was doing, uh, in addition to Star Trek, I also played a regular on one of our competitor series, Stargate Atlantis. Oh. And I remember uh, that it was kind of a shock when they found out that the show was ending only a few weeks before. We found out that the season finale was the series finale. And I'd only been on, you know, as a regular for a year, but I remember the rest of the cast uh, seeing quite a bit of shock and dismay that, that they found out on such short notice that the that the whole thing was coming to an end it's always short notice because they don't want everybody to freak out sometimes and like bob said sometimes you don't find out till afterwards oh, you don't yeah. realize it's the complete yeah. finale yeah so that's very sad yeah. well we all like having a job that's the great thing about actors <laughs> we yeah. like working yeah we like to work even though my favorite you know the truest joke you'll ever hear about an actor for those of you watching that are not actors is uh, one that we all hear. I'm sure you heard it, Jane, when you were 18 years I old. I think I know what you're going to say. How do you, yeah. How do you, how do you make an actor complain? Give him a job. So yes, <laughs> so, we complain whether we're working and then we complain more bitter, bitterly when we're not. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think that's just human nature. It's totally fair. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on this pair of episodes? From no, there? I just, I really liked so much about the episodes, you know, um, once again, just the writing, Dr. Harai, uh, you know, yeah. Tig, these, uh, Let's how to let's figure out how to say that in math. Um, yep. It was funny, just a lot of um, a lot oh. of good stuff. So I love the, her scene. Uh, Tig is saying uh, when she wanted hot and sour soup, and she's it's not really going to help, but but I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm just hungry. hungry. She's, she's hilarious. So Have you ever um, seen her do? I saw her at Carnegie Hall. She's quite an amazing um, uh, comedian. Oh, or I, 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 I don't know if, it, if that's not a, a big enough word to talk about her talent, but it's fun to see her uh, in this role. And I might as well confess to the audience that I had not seen much of Discovery. So it was a delight for me to see how extraordinary the cast is. Um, the, uh, also, the level of the visual effects Everything about it was was very exciting and really, really good performances all around. And I have said it before and I'll say it again. I still can't understand why a Vulcan can't get a good wig. Is there a reason why, you know, they, they get good wigs for other creatures? I think, you know, it doesn't seem fair, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I love those too. I thought the performances were outstanding. The effects were outstanding. Mm -hmm. This one was, I noticed, it was a little bit, the last one was a little bit longer than the others. I'm not sure if that's typical for, well, I guess it wouldn't have been typical in the 90s because everything was like set by when oh, it's yeah. like slotted between commercials and other TV shows. With streaming though, it was interesting. This was about 10 minutes longer. So that was mm -hmm. going to be- And also the length of the episodes has to do with how fast your actors speak, I remember. Oh, interesting. I do remember that Brandon Braga said to me, I could, my, our Voyager episodes could be six or eight pages longer than the uh, Enterprise episodes because we had more fast talkers. <laughs> That's amazing. So, mm -hmm. That's funny. I love that. Right. Any final uh, insights or thoughts? No, this has just been fun. Thank you, Bob. What, oh, what a thanks, fun Bob. addition. <laughs> yeah, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you both for asking me. Um, I will come yeah, back in the future sometime to discuss some other very, very important issue. All right? Definitely. definitely. Yes. And, and Jane, thank you. I mean, we're, this is concluding our season four discussion. So we're going to go on a little hiatus true. again, too. So that's right. Thank you for yeah. a wonderful partnership as always. I always love these. Awesome. It's so much fun. Thank yeah. you. And thanks, everybody, Bye, for watching. Guys. Take care. Live longer. EMH out. I'm left handed. Oh, good work. Cool. Yeah, I did it. <laughs>